session is um, set up to be kind of a uh, local health department inspector training for those of you involved in the campground, public swimming pool, and septage programs. Um, this is intended to be very informal, so if you have questions during uh, the presentation, during certain parts of, of what we're talking about, please go ahead and feel free to put your questions in the chat or you know you can utilize the uh, the team's tools to raise your hand or unmute yourself and go ahead and, and ask your question. We'll we'll try to address that uh, as best we can. I uh, wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, I'm well aware that we're we're all very busy. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of things going on nowadays, not just with with the three programs that I just mentioned, but with with all of your work out out at the local health departments. Um, you know, this is intended again to be uh, an assist to you, uh, a show of support to you. Try and help you um, work through some of those problems that that we're all seeing out at campgrounds, swimming pools and, and septage. Uh, land application sites, septage vehicle inspections, those type of things. Uh, our, our goal is, you know, never to be perfect, but always striving for for continuous improvement. Uh, and speaking of continuous improvement, that's kind of some of the things that we'll talk about today. Um, some of the tools that we're working on, whether that's uh, some Power BI reports that are posted on our program websites or our MyEdWIS tool that we're continuing to refine and have a release scheduled for later this month that will provide some additional tools to, to local health department staff. Um, but first, I'd like to start with uh, some introductions of, of our staff. I, if you joined early, you kind of saw the coverage map scrolling through. Uh, we do have a, a, a few new folks um, in all the programs and just wanted to make sure that you all um, got to know their names. Uh, likely you've received an email from them or a phone call or, or will over the summer. So just wanted to like I said, introduce all of our staff and, and the folks that could make it today. We 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 likely have a, a couple that aren't going to be on, but we'll go ahead and start with uh, with the septage program. Uh, I believe Greg Miracle, our our program coordinator, is on. Uh, if he could turn his camera on, and we'll have Matt Rockhold as well. So these are kind of our, our central office based staff. Um, Greg uh, strives for you know consistency out in the field, so a, a big deal of what uh, he, he does is is working on the uh, the higher level stuff, uh, all the septage storage tanks that come in. Greg's working on those with the field staff, all the uh, septage waste receiving facility. Uh, stuff that comes in, whether that's a privately owned one or at a municipal wastewater treatment plant. Greg's involved in that. Matt uh, touches every single piece of paper, every payment, uh, every inspection report that comes in for the septage program. So he uh, he likely sends you a few emails uh, throughout the year. And then we have uh, Jake Lesniak and uh, Ben Love. Who are kind of our lower peninsula field staff. Uh, Jake's based out of the Gaylord office and lives just just south of that Gaylord office. Ben's based out of the Kalamazoo district office and lives just east of there. So we've uh, changed kind of our lower peninsula split from a, a, a north south line kind of, you know, one covering the, the west side, one covering the east side to now a north and a south portion of the, the lower peninsula. So Ben covers the, the southern portion. Uh, Jake covers the northern portion. Um, hopefully most of you are aware that Rob Wolf, our, our UP septage program staff, um, this is his last week, so he's got one more day <laughs> uh, in the office. He's he's working on cleaning up all his files and things like that. So tomorrow's his last day with us. and. Um, 
a new new staff person is is currently being uh, recommended for for an, a job offer. Uh, so hopefully in the next few weeks we'll we'll hear about who that person's going to be, um, whether they've got you know experience in the program or not. But uh, we'll be we'll be updating our coverage maps, and those coverage maps are are always found on our program websites. And I'll kind of go through the program websites at a high level here in a minute too. But this is kind of our, our base septage program staff right here. Um, thanks guys. Go ahead and, and uh, move on to, so campgrounds and pools are, are pretty unique in that we've got four engineers that work in both programs. And then we have some, some additional staff uh, that, that kind of handle similar to what to what Matt Rockhold does for septage. Um, Sarah Rotiers covers for campgrounds and Starla Walter covers for for pools. So thanks Sarah. Sarah's our campground program administrator. She's the person touching every single piece of paper, every payment that comes in for for campgrounds, uh, every inspection report. So I, I know a lot of you know Sarah. She's been with the program for uh, 10 years now, I think, or going on 10 years later this year will be 10 years. Um, and then we have, uh, like I mentioned, four engineers. I'll go alphabetically. Josh Aiden kind of covers the southeast portion of the state to the south portion of the state. Um, Karen Beauchamp is our engineer specialist focusing on pools, so she's covering the uh, the counties with a lot of pools in them. Uh, then we have uh, Barbara Quinlan, who just joined us three months ago, and she's covering um, kind of the northeast portion of the Lower Peninsula and then the eastern portion of the UP. So there's been some some transitions there in coverage. And then Zach Zach Wagner joined us six months ago, so he's covering. Um, I guess you can call it the western side of the lower peninsula and the western side of of the upper peninsula. Um, so yeah, it, you know, if you haven't heard from them yet or exchanged emails with them, I'm sure you will soon. Um, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about. We we do we're aware of a lot of issues going on right now out there, compliance issues, payment issues uh, related to. More campgrounds and swimming pools than than the septage program stuff, but we um, we have uh, been blessed with a kind of a bigger build out of our enforcement unit, and and have been getting a lot of help from them. Uh, we do have a couple enforcement unit staff on here uh, today, so if we have questions kind of related to procedural items, uh, how to address compliance assistance into enforcement, those type of things, there. They're available to help us out with those those questions. So, um, so yeah, that's the brains of the operation. All the folks I introduced. I'm just the idiot supervisor. So, uh, if if you need help, reach out to them. They loop me in when when we need to to get some additional resources or help. Um, whether that's enforcement unit or, or working with our admin group on on payment stuff or you know other other uh, eagle divisions and programs as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of our our staff. Um, kind of the next thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is mentioned enforcement and tracking. We've been working, um, got a lot of good recommendations from from you, the local health department staff, on on ways to address you know, uh, non-payments, uh, unauthorized operation, construction before permits are issued. So we're we're finding better ways to address that. We've recently looped in uh, attorney general assistance and, and uh, you know, tried to move through a, a, a more legal manner in addressing some of those recalcitrant property owners that are either building campgrounds and operating them without ever getting any Eagle or local health department approvals or um, 
uh, building pools without appropriate approvals, operating pool pools after getting issued closing orders, those type of things. So we're we're really leaning on the enforcement unit, and they've been finding finding some great great tools to try and bring folks back into compliance, and we'll we'll continue to explore new ways to do that. Um, yeah, I guess the next thing I wanted to talk about, uh, we'll kind of go through the um, our, our program websites have been updated. I wanted to just kind of share um, what those look like. And while we're, we're looking at them, I will show you some of our Power BI reports. So Sarah, feel free to jump in if, if I'm missing anything on the campgrounds program uh, website. But yeah, kind of a new look. Uh, all the same information is there. Um, we have this this list of licensed campgrounds right here. You click on that and it will open up uh, a Power BI report. Let's see if I can do it. This thing's. So yeah, so this is just a, a two page Power BI report and it's showing um, all the currently active licensed campgrounds for Michigan and you can see it's sorted alphabetically. Uh, there's a, a second page to the report if you wanted to hone in on your specific county. Uh, let's go ahead and pick on uh, Berrien County. shows 13 active campground or actively licensed campgrounds. You can kind of see the, the names here. Uh, if you wanted to focus in more, you know, show one page, you can do that. Um, click on it again and, and it kind of resets. So there's there's a little functionality there. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It, uh, it has the issued dates, expiration dates here. Um, so that's kind of uh, the Power BI report available for campgrounds, but all the additional information is still here. There's a, a, a new drop down that has some of the guidance documents, uh, some of our um, policy documents, rule documents, the, the, the law um, and rules are right here, this first link, some additional information there inspection reports, some information on temporary campgrounds, uh, some information on, on my EdWIS that is available there as well. Um, but but it, our updated coverage map is always going to be right here. So what was scrolling earlier, um, open that up. You can see the coverage areas for, for Barbara, uh, Karen's in blue here, Josh in orange, uh, Zach in green. Just one thing to add um, regarding the list of licensed campgrounds that is supposed to be updated every night automatically. So it is a good place to do a quick check um, to see if the license has been issued yet or not. Good point. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. All right. Uh, so under the the pool website. So again, it's a it's kind of an updated format that uh, was rolled out statewide. Again, we've got the pool coverage map here, right at the top. We've got our uh, general email inbox that Starla monitors, as well as uh, uh, Katerina and myself on occasion, um, and. A lot of our forms, additional information is all down here as it always was. Some FAQ documents at the bottom. Uh, but our, our Power BI report for pools is right here. And this one's a set up a little bit differently. So this is going to be all active pools, but it's also going to show which ones are licensed. So you can see currently in our IT system, we, sh we have 5,313 pools that are designated as active. So that means that they were constructed, um, 
you know, received an initial inspection, were licensed at some point, and as far as we know, they're open and active, operating. Um, Forty-seven, over forty-seven hundred of those are actively licensed. Uh, and there's two pages to this document. The second page has has uh, a map, so you can kind of choose. Um, let's go ahead and pick Allegan County for this one. You can kind of see Allegan County uh, where where these pools are are located. If you had you know interest in a specific one, you could either select it from the map or just pick it from the list. Um, Go back to that first page. I'll choose Allegan County here as well. You can kind of see shows 91 active pools, 83 of which are, are currently licensed. So if you kind of scroll through, you're going to see some different colors show up for uh, for the pools that we have listed as active, but maybe they're not actively licensed right now so this one gives a license status uh, awaiting initial inspection i think we've been working on that one uh, actively to kind of figure out what happened with that situation you'll see other ones where they had a license last year maybe they didn't renew yet maybe they didn't pay yet or maybe they had compliance issues um, that we're working on to get resolved before that license hold is released um, but just a, just another tool to kind of help you understand where things are at. Hopefully you find it useful. <clears throat> uh, if there's any additional information that you'd like to see on any of those uh, Power BI reports, let us know. We can work with our our IT team to um, to make enhancements. It's it's pretty easy on the Power BI reports, but it takes a few uh, few levels of approvals before the the new version gets published uh, onto the septage page. You can see that that kind of that same new format. Uh, Greg's information's up here at the top. The coverage maps right here. Link to that. Uh, a link to our uh, continuing septage education information for haulers and health department staff as well. And then we've got uh, a, a link here for the directories, and this is where the Power BI reports for for septage are located. Uh, it'll be these top two. So the first one is this um, septage hauler directory. And again, it's got two pages. This first page shows a little map of where all the septage haulers are located. Um, the directories at top and then vehicle information. So let's um, let's pick a different county here. Let's do Bay County. See that map kind of shrinks in. We've got four four haulers within Bay County um, with looks like six vehicles. So not a ton of stuff going on there, but <clears throat> if we wanted that detailed information, we could certainly do that. And again, you can you know go go to focus mode and and see that information a little bit better. Go back on the second page is where the land application site information will will reside again the, the top part will be the same it'll be that septage hauler directory part um, doesn't look like we have any land appliers in bay county so bay county's not showing up as an option we'll go ahead and select chippewa county uh, you can kind of see the uh, the land sites uh, showing up as a dot we do have a few stragglers, so we're um, we'll try and work to get those corrected. You can see that showing Sugar Island is down here, um, not quite the correct location, but but yeah, this is kind of a a good tool for figuring out where things are at, uh, what what's on your your inspection list for for the year. Uh, the other the other directory that we have is the septage receiving facility directory so you can see a map showing all the different colors for the different counties there you can kind of choose one i know barry's got a few few uh within their jurisdiction and you kind of see the information provided there All right. 
So those are the program websites. Um, what I wanted to show you next is kind of a, a, a sneak peek at what's coming for the next MyAdWiss release. And I've logged in as Kevin Green out of Calhoun County just to just to kind of show an example of of what this new dashboard will look like for my address right now um, when current health department users log in they're going to see one one of these screens right here and it'll be kind of an activity history you can see Kevin hasn't created any or at least any that are showing up in this version of the system likely his staff are are submitting the inspection reports and and not Kevin directly but the new dashboard the the new landing place for for local health department staff will be this and it and, and it kind of consists of a few different things there'll be a, this welcome widget here this box that just has a general welcome message we'll be able to modify that message throughout the year if there's um, reminders or important information we want to communicate to local health department staff uh, any messages on open activities will show up here. Uh, don't, don't see any in this version of the system. But the big focus, the big benefit that we're we're trying to advertise or or let you know about today is are these two two uh, widgets here: the open inspection activities and the open task uh, widget, where um, this will show all the campground, public swimming pools, septage vehicle, septage land site, and septage waste receiving facility inspections assigned to your jurisdiction. Uh, there's there's this filter button here I can go up. Right now campgrounds isn't showing up, but they're, they're working on uh, getting that uh, configured before the release on, on May 30th, but I can kind of sort, say I want to look at the, the land inspection uh, the land site inspections for for septage within within our county. Go ahead and select that button, hit the filter, and it shows. Okay, we've got three three inspections that haven't been completed. So these would be the open ones, the the not completed ones. And you can see Mark Bose and Son has two land sites, and Nile Hanshit. So you can access these inspection activities directly through here. Uh, this is going to be where the uh, the ability to conduct an inspection is found through a through a dynamic form. Uh, it's not showing up in here yet. It's still being configured, but there's the ability to send send a message. Uh, you would pick. So Ben covers this area, and Matt's our our program administrator. You can kind of send a me message to either of them through this activity. You can attach attach your inspection report if if you conducted it. Uh, in a different way, not through through my Edwis. Um, Eagle can attach things here, kind of gives a timeline at the bottom, but but uh, there will be additional training that we're going to provide once we once all this is configured and and ready for release. But just just wanted to provide you a very high level sneak peek at what this is going to look like. And there's the ability for Kevin to to come in here and kind of edit his his contact card information. Uh, at the bottom, all the entities for your jurisdiction are going to show up here. So this is going to be all the campgrounds, all the public swimming pools, all the septage hauler uh, vehicles and land sites, those type of things. So again, there, there'll be a filter here where you can you can say we want to look at at the campgrounds. So all the campgrounds start with a CG designation. We can hit that filter button. And you see it shows the 16 campgrounds within Calhoun County. And you know, it's a snapshot of information, the name, address, uh, the city, uh, and their their current status. So have a few uh, inactive campgrounds showing up and uh, the rest are active. So that's just kind of again a, a sneak peek of, of what's to come for uh, local health departments. Uh, if you're a user in the system, so if if you're not a user yet, um, now might be a good time to to start that process of of getting your user account, and then once this release comes here, May 30th, 
uh, when you log in, you'll you'll kind of have access to all this information and, and there'll be further refinements in that in the information that you'll have access to. As we go along. I don't know if anybody had any questions on. Uh, that I see. Uh, yeah, there's a comment in here about the, the difference between Wayne and, and Detroit. Um, yeah, that's that's something that we can we can work on correcting. I'm going to take a note note on that. We do have the ability to designate uh, the county as Detroit that was that was built into the system. I think there's only only one pool right now that that was when the data was brought over, it was brought over correctly with the designation of Detroit instead of showing Wayne County. But now, um, now I guess is the the bulk of the intent of this this meeting, this training was to kind of talk about uh, when you're out doing the inspection inspections, what what uh, recommendation or what um, designation you should you should give that inspection. So. We did share some information earlier this year on how we wanted, as you're submitting inspection reports in my EDWIS, how how to um, just a second. And you also have a question in the chat in the chat, Jeremy. OK. Get this figured out here. All right. Yeah, so the question in the chat is uh, are sanitarians expected to enter their inspection information uh, or do they still do paper inspection forms and the clerks upload them to the site? Uh, so there's still going to be the ability to do either. Um, the goal is once once that ability to conduct an inspection directly in my EDWIS. So basically it's going to pull up a dynamic form where there will be a series of um, compliance questions. Yes, yes, no, or NA is, is the response for all those questions. Um, There'll be the ability to conduct that inspection within my EDWIS using that dynamic form, but we're aware that there are quite a few local health departments that are currently conducting their own uh, electronic inspections out in the field. Utilizing their own software, so we're not going to require dual entry or you to use our system instead of your own system that you paid. Uh, good money to to have developed and and are familiar with are trained up on. So there there will still be the ability to um, submit a PDF copy of either the output of of your IT system uh, as the inspection report form or a, a PDF copy of the inspection report itself to us. Um, like I said, we'll be we'll be working on uh, a training program for local health departments on kind of these new enhancements to the system to this release 15 um, and kind of have some additional suggestions or or input on how to handle that you know every every health department's going to be in a different situation um, i know we've got over 1100 pool inspections in the system already so th those are already completed you know obviously it's a pdf copy of either the hard hard copy that was that was filled out by hand and submitted to us or uh, the output of uh, a, another it system that that's used at the local level and submitted to us so uh, there's 
there's going to be continue to be options. Uh, we'll talk about you know how that dynamic form is going to work and and how to use it when it makes sense to do something else. Those type of things as part of that that training to come a little bit later. But yes, very good question. Thank you. But yeah, then the next part, like I said, was was to to kind of talk about that the the in compliance, the insubstantial compliance, and and not not in compliance. So this is very for pools. The the old language used to be approved, conditionally approved, not approved. Uh, for septage and campgrounds, the language was always in compliance, in substantial compliance, or not in compliance. So this is kind of going to be the new language. Of course, that that top top recommendation in compliance is going to be when you go out, uh, you're checking yes, everything's in compliance. There's no no compliance comments showing up on your inspection report form, no issues at all. Uh, the other two options, the in substantial compliance, the not in compliance, are you know where where we need some analysis, you know, some some technical analysis, some some good thoughts out in the field to to figure that out. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward. Sometimes there's a little gray area, and that's kind of what this what this refresher training is about. So I'm gonna kind of toss it over to our our programs now, our program staff to to kind of talk through where where these differences show up. And I believe uh, Sarah volunteered to go first with with campgrounds. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. So since things are changing and eventually we're, we're slowly morphing in from paper forms to using Eddy, we are trying to figure out a way to make the owners have more responsibility, especially when they're in not in compliance, um, especially when there's high priority violations, kind of similar to food service establishment inspections where you're really focusing on the high priorities. I don't know what they're called now. I've been out of it too long, but um, we're just, we're trying to go down that same path. And so for campgrounds, you know, in compliance, like Jeremy mentioned, it's a perfect inspection that doesn't happen often, but it does happen sometimes. In substantial compliance, one minor thing or many minor things, but still you feel confident enough to recommend relicensure. Maybe you'll decide to do a follow up. It's going to be very subjective. It's going to be a judgment call. You can always contact us for for assistance if if you need to, but not in compliance. We're really trying to focus on that now because we're seeing some pretty um, high risk situations out there in campgrounds and the owners are not really following up as much as they should be. And, you know, with Michigan, the camping industry has really blown up, especially since COVID. And we do have the biggest camping industry in the state. So it's really time to hold these owners feet to the fire and make sure they're um, at least in substantial compliance. Um, so, you know, once my edifice is built out and you're doing the inspection reports through the system, you're going to see notes. If if there's a category that's in, that's a high priority risk, um, it will pop up saying it's a high priority and that a follow up inspection is required. But not it's not always necessary to do a follow-up inspection. Like, as you know, sometimes just an email with photographic evidence or just an email explaining what they did is enough. And so, and you, and please make sure you have your follow-up inspection fees so you get paid for this extra work if you do have to go back out. Um, a couple of the high priorities I wanted to mention specifically for campgrounds are drowning risks. Because there has been about 10 deaths, I think, in the campground, in campgrounds since I've started. Um, it's one of those programs where, you know, unfortunately there are deaths. And we we do want to, you know, really focus on, on that. Um, the drowning risks of children are, well, not just children, but drowning risks are the, the main focus here. And so we want to see 
um, those be corrected before before relicensure. Um, and if you see a drowning risk such as um, unsecured septic tank lids or risers, either you know maybe the hauler didn't screw them back in or the owner's just keeping it accessible because they have to keep pumping because they might have a problem. Whatever the case may be, we know how many rogue children are running around these campgrounds. So we really, we do have to be careful with these septic tanks. And then the second drowning risk is the beach safety equipment. Um, we're kind, we're still on the hook for original 1978, you know, public health code language for beach safety. So we kind of drill down what that means for beaches at campgrounds and um, the life or the throw ring with a float rope attached to it and signage is our best recommendation we can provide. Now there's always gonna be those outliers, those cases where the owner says, well, I have a note from my insurance company that says that we're not supposed to do that or we're going to do this instead. So again, those, are, those can be case by case, but we're really trying hard just to keep it standardized, throw ring, float rope tied to it with signage. Um, you know, we don't like to talk about public health in terms of liability, but when it comes to drowning, it, it is a big deal because if there's a drowning um, incident, 100% there's going to be lawyers involved and they're going to study the inspection reports. They're going to ask, why was this relicensed when this risk even existed last year? Why wasn't this corrected? You know, so just kind of keep that in mind um, when we're slowly morphing into this new system that the high priorities are gonna be marked. And a couple other um, examples might be the lack of, you know, water pre-opening sampling or certification if it's non-community supply. You know, if, if they're not doing that, if they're not making sure their water supply is safe, then, you know, that needs to be followed up on. So I just wanted to put that out there that we're, we're trying to get that responsibility back on the owner so they see right in their report that relationship will not happen the following year until this is corrected um, because we can only do so much, you can only do so much. So thank you for the good work out there. I know it's a messy program. Email me anytime you have questions. I, I'm happy to assist. And I think that's all I had right now. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess a couple points I wanted to highlight um, related to uh, inspection reports, and and obviously we're we're utilizing these to make um, enforcement actions, to uh, send out compliance communication letters, to issue licenses for. You know, new facilities or new vehicles, new land sites, et cetera. So, the the sooner you can get those submitted to us, the better. That gives us, you know, time to to work on a, a response plan if we're seeing issues. You know, if it's a in substantial compliance designation or it's a if it's a not in compliance situation, definitely we're we're gonna um, see that show up right away. And kind of the goal of of setting up these three designations are. Uh, as we further refine uh, our IT system into automating things, so so that the the goal is that those situations where we're getting a in compliance designation on an inspection, whether it's a brand new pool or or campground or you know an existing one, uh, new new vehicle or existing vehicle, uh, new land site or existing or septage waste receiving facility. That that there's some automation within the system. That okay, they they meet the inspection standard. The the facility, the vehicle, whatever it may be, is still being operated appropriate appropriately, maintained appropriately. Uh, we build in a a check for uh, payment. You know that satisfies another condition. There, there, there's a desire to have some automation where, um, if a an external user, a, a property owner, whomever it may be, meets these these conditions, that they they get an automatic license renewal 
and, and they're able to print that off or or their initial initial license is issued right away provided we've you know we've got that in compliance inspection there's no need for eagle staff to review it and look for any any compliance comments or anything else um, if it shows up as in substantial compliance or not in compliance that's where we want our staff to to focus their their uh, their time is kind of troubleshooting those issues those more um, non-compliant properties uh, or vehicles you know again whatever it may be kind of focusing our time on on the problems instead of you know having to to spend a lot of administrative time double checking everything so that that's the ultimate goal is to uh, to build in some automation you know our good actors are going to be able to get their get their licenses renewed faster those type of things um, again thanks sarah all right now i guess uh we'll give pools a break and and transition to uh septage I see. I see. We have a question. Go ahead. Rob Wolf is a legend. Legend. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the pool program has a nice sheet that has the different category of violations uh, color coded. That wouldn't be a bad thing to have for the other programs if you're looking to have those determinations more clearly made. And even that pool program, it would be nice if if it went right into the the actual rules and color coded the actual rule set because on that report the report is what's color coded there's still some interpretation has to be made as far as what section of the rule the color coding is pertaining to and some of the items on the report have two different color codings on it so exactly. but i mean i i know you're it sounds like you're doing this because you're going to have it in the my edwis um function but yeah if a uh, It'll take a little bit of time, but that would be something that would be really clear for an inspector to follow and, and be able to Certainly. make a, a call on if it looked like that. Yeah, great point. Great point. Yes, and and we did. Sarah mentioned it briefly, uh, but yes, the uh, the priorities. So kind of that color color coding, low, um, medium or standard priority and then the high priority. So kind of the you know, the green, yellow, red are are being built in and and as you you mentioned they're tied to the rule itself not so much the the compliance question because the compliance question can touch on a few different rules so um that is that is being incorporated into the system and once once that that's fully configured and and we're uh ready to roll out training we can show you how that looks in the system and how that how that's going to work basically when you're in the dynamic form of where the inspection questions are so you know thinking about the current paper form today where it it says you know does the enclosure pool enclosure comply well there's a lot of rules that go along with that so what we're we're adding after that question uh, is the spe specific rule citations and you'll be able to click on each of those within the system it'll pop up the rule in another box and you can kind of read what the full rule says uh, that priority that that low medium high priority will will be attached to the rule as well you'll be able to see that right there in the system so it's supposed to be pretty good and and it's looking pretty good some of the preliminary versions that i've seen it's it's a lot of configuration and we're working with our our team to make sure that it's functioning how it's supposed to be but um yeah we're, we're hopeful to get that rolled out here soon and again to be able to try provide training and, and kind of show you all the benefits that that will come with with utilizing that all right yeah so i'll toss it to uh to matt greg jake and ben uh to kind of walk through the septage program I know septage program can be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, you know whether they're in compliance or not in compliance. A lot less inspection check boxes and questions re uh, related to those inspection report forms. But uh, let's let's go ahead and and do a high level overview. And then again, any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or or raise your hand.
Actually, Rob, you have your hand up again. Yeah, I just wondered about like that campground program as an example. If if there was some kind of enforcement procedure, it doesn't have to be anything real complex, but if there was an enforcement guidance document from Eagle that the local health department could follow, and if maybe that was worked into the, the contract between the two entities, um, that the health department would follow that guidance enforcement, I think that would be pretty helpful because um, it sounds good that a health department would try to recoup money from fault inspections, but um, we don't always get paid if we were to bill for those and it would be easier for a health department just to kick it over to Eagle. That's what I'd be more inclined to do. Not that I don't want to help, but I mean, there, there's a couple of pools that it could be problematic with. Sure. Yeah, understand. Brad, I, I don't know if you're on and want to talk about uh, some of the SOPs, standard operating procedures that are being worked on related to enforcement. There's There's been quite an effort going on to um, run those up and down the, the chain of command for uh, review and approval and. Yeah, um, I don't have much on the campground or pool SOPs right now. Um, we're, uh, we established a enforcement unit for the division um, last fall. So we're kind of in the process of building an overarching enforcement policy for the division itself and then we'll go through and create sops for each of the programs um so that would be something to look for in the future but i don't i don't have anything specific on how to process that right now yeah and i and i didn't mention it earlier but uh there there was an effort to kind of change our our contract language for for campgrounds and pools um, kind of that reimbursement contract for for the inspections. It's still it's still going to be one one in uh, one reimbursement per, per property or pool each year. So we're still not to a point where we we have uh, enough funding to pay for reinspections and things like that. But changed it from licensed pools or licensed campgrounds to active so if there's a you know uh, an active campground that we just haven't been able to license either because of fee payments or compliance issues we still want you and your staff to get out there and inspect it same with pools if if we've just haven't been able to issue a license because of paperwork issues payment issues compliance issues we still we still want eyes on on that facility to identify you know what what compliance issues we're seeing um and that's where we you know we we start working with Brad and and the enforcement team to to figure out a way to to move forward to get a response to either get them licensed or get them shut down um and there's also been i think we're on the second fiscal year of uh, some general fund money support for both campgrounds and pools so you know we all realize that 25 dollars for a campground inspection doesn't cover much maybe maybe not even the gas to to get there and back uh same with pools you know 30 dollars for for a pool inspection isn't enough reimbursement so we've had uh, uh this general fund money that that's kind of allocated to each jurisdiction based on the number of active campgrounds, the number of active pools within their jurisdiction um, that that gets them upwards. So uh, kind of bounces that that number from 25 per campground to about a hundred hundred dollars per campground that that you're getting reimbursement. So there's about another another 75, 80 dollars added on uh, in ge general fund support. So that can be used for for staff time for tools uh, needed to conduct that that program work for for both campgrounds and pools. Um, but yeah, I see Matt dropped off. Uh, was was there any septage items that you guys wanted to cover? I see a question on pools. We'll go ahead and get to that pool question after after septage. Yeah, for the definitions, like Jeremy had mentioned, the definitions for septage of these three, um, basically they're not going to change with 
how it's already completed. The only thing we ask is, depending on what is wrong, what's happening, how it affects the environment and the safety of the people around them. So if it's not environmentally safe, of course, it'd be non-compliance. If it's just like uh, the lettering on the truck isn't there, that's not really going to hurt the environment. It can be done within the next year of your next annual inspection. So it's not really a huge issue unless it's going to be environmental. Does anyone else, Greg, or anyone else have any additions? Uh, yeah, I can talk um, just more about program specific. Um, like you said, the, the lettering on trucks, that's become a somewhat common issue for new vehicles. So again, maybe just a photo once they get the seal supplied and the, the two inch lettering on there um, and just mark it in compliance is fine for us. Um, as you go towards like an annual inspection, you know, I've noticed that some seals are possibly on the doors or in the wrong locations. So just let them know for the next time they go to apply. Um, but again, just kind of mark it on the form as a no. Um, but they can still be in compliance because they're still showing the seals. It's just in a long, wrong location. Uh, maybe double checking the VIN numbers is helpful. I've noticed a couple of them aren't quite like they're missing a digit. They're supposed to be 17. So um, for vehicle themselves, they might be um, need to be rechecked. Otherwise, trailers have a smaller amount of digits for their VIN or identifier. Um, we did meet out with uh, DH10 uh, to do some new land site locations. So um, if you have staff that needs some training, you know, me or Jake are always available to go over some of the new sites. Uh, they do change between injections, surface application, um, some new haulers, uh, depending on how many sites they have, it will change their cropping plans and such. So we're always willing to go over that with you. Yep. Um, same thing with doing uh, annual inspections on those. They can be a little difficult sometimes. So, you know, any questions, just bounce them off of us. We'll work with you to get through those. Uh, Jake, you got anything for land sites? I think you covered everything for for the land sites. Just like Ben said, if you need need assistance, you're not sure if you're doing it right or if you're missing some things, just give us a call. We could schedule us like two weeks out. We can come over, uh, walk you through everything. Um, just the only other things that I would have is when um, is not really uh, pertain to the in compliance or substantial stuff. It's just when we uh, email out, just uh, shoot us a bounce back email saying, yep, we got it because we've been having some issues with when we send out the inspections to uh, the health departments to be done is they're not being received uh, in the right times. We're using the emails that we have in Eddie. We're using emails that we've had for a little bit. Uh, so our policy is we usually email the EH directors uh, and have them delegate to their staff. And there's just sometimes that we're emails get lost. And it's just nice to we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, better people to email to, you know, Ben and I are new. So we're taking notes on who what counties delegate to to who. So we're going to be CCing them in the email. So um, if you get an email from us, just shoot us an email back saying understood, got it. Or even if uh, the truck's not ready, because a lot of new trucks, they send us the application. And if um, if you're trying to schedule with them, and they don't have the truck yet. Just send us back. Hey, uh, they're they're not the truck's not scheduled yet because it's still being built, or we're working on it, or we plan to schedule it with you know in so many times. So just get, give us a heads up so we're not uh, we don't keep bugging you guys. Yeah, we got we got a question in the chat. Uh, can you give some examples of issues for septage that would result in a not in compliance declaration? So um, I'm thinking, you know, and I've just going to throw out some scenarios and I'll let I'll let uh, the program staff answer it. So say we find uh, some debris in a field that maybe looks like uh, septage hasn't been screened. Maybe we see um, something that doesn't comply with uh, the cropping plan that was approved earlier in the year. Maybe we see um, some expansion of a, a land site or you know maybe Maybe they're approved to uh, inject, but they are not land applying. Maybe there's some issues with isolations. Um, some initial thoughts there. Yeah, definitely like a leaking vehicle. 
or it's not holding a vacuum. Um, if there's a trail of any kind, you know, that's telling us that it's not being sealed properly. So those are all definite things to say not in compliance for um, as it goes for just vehicles themselves. Um, obviously, if the vehicle is not registered or licensed, that's an immediate failure. Um, for land sites, like you said, screening, isolation distances, um, failure to follow the cropping plan, those are all things that would be in non-compliance. Uh, some things may be just a misunderstanding. So again, some of it can be kind of um, up to you to work with the hauler um, to see exactly, you know, where was the misunderstanding, the communication breakdown. Um, anything else you can think of, Jake? Something that would uh, go along with uh, the fields for not screening if um, the septage isn't being incorporated. If there's ponding going on, it's uh, or if you notice that there uh, at the time of inspection when um, you can see they there's a wet spot in the field or standing water in the field and they apply it through it or uh, real close to it, then it's definitely uh, let us know about that. Very good. Yeah, and I guess this this is a just a question for everybody to hear. So if if um, I was out inspecting a, a land application site and it didn't look like it complied with with the cropping plan, maybe they they uh, indicated corn on the cropping plan, and you see you know some type of grass or or wheat uh, planted and and growing. What what would you recommend? Um, the inspector do next would would you have them um, talk with the the hauler or kind of issue a, a, a insubstantial compliance or not in compliance first and then kind of work on a resolution what what steps would would you recommend there well uh, I would double check with the hauler and make sure that they didn't change their cropping plan because they always have the option as the year is going on um, but we would just have to adjust the AAR depending on which type of crop they're adjusting to. So, you know, it might be something of insubstantial depending on uh, whether or not you have the information. Again, talking to them and seeing, you know, you indicated on corn on this plan. Did you guys end up changing? Did you let people know? Did you let us know as a health department? So just, you know, getting to the questions about it. Yeah, and, and I, that's kind of the, the response I was trying to get to is that that cropping plan is is a plan and plans do change so it it's kind of a living document for the year there there can be a, amendments adjustments to it provided you know we we get those amendments and adjustments in writing and and not just uh, uh while you're out conducting the inspection so we we do want to see kind of a formal update to those cropping plans as crop or other changes are made there and and yeah like like Ben said there there can be adjustments to the approved rate for for that change in crops or you know cycling one one field off or one field on we, you know we we have to to make sure we had soil samples and other things in place to to support what whatever that change might be looks like Greg might have something to add there too I just wanted to be ready in case I did, but yeah, I think um, it depends on the specific case. Like like Ben and Jake said, is if there's a reasonable explanation for the changes and and they they have adjusted their application rates appropriately, uh, then that would be in substantial compliance. And just note that they may need to change you know their cropping plan on file with us. Um, if they're if they land applied at the corn. Uh, you know, agronomic rate and now they're growing soybeans or something different and it's vastly inappropriate, then that would be a definitely not in compliance and could lead to enforcement. Uh, you know, there's things we could do to to correct those situations. We'd work with the with the farmer to, to correct that issue. Uh, we can add, you know, like a winter cover crop and, and stuff like that into the rotation to absorb the extra nutrients. So it's important that you let us know of those uh, non conformance with the cropping plan on file issues. Um, but that said, farming is uh, 
you know, farmers have to be flexible. They they adapt not only to uh, like the weather, for instance, but they also adapt to commodity prices and, and things like that. So, you know, if you're going to grow a corn crop and corn's not going to be worth anything come harvest time, you you're going to likely change your mind to you know grow something else, and we have to be accommodating of that. All right, thanks, Septage team. Um, yeah, so Starla, Starla Walter, our our pool um, program licensing tech, wasn't able to join us today, but she had a couple items she wanted me to mention as we transition into swimming pools. Um, there is a difference between an initial inspection and a, kind of a seasonal opening inspection. Initial inspection is is when we have construction or modification of, of a pool, and that would be, you know, a, a submission to Eagle, construction permit application to Eagle, where we're approving that. We're issuing a construction permit. Uh, that construction's completed, and they're looking to get it uh, inspected, approved, and then that pool relicensed. So that that's what we call an initial inspection. Seasonal opening inspection is is a licensed pool, seasonal pool that you know maybe is outdoors or or other reason. It's just seasonal seasonal community or whatever it may be that they shut down every every winter or fall and then reopen in the spring or summer. So that would be kind of the seasonal opening. Sometimes we see those uh, those boxes checked on uh, in the wrong spots. And she also wanted to recommend folks get on and check out that uh, Power BI report. It's got all the the updated swimming pool numbers. Uh, I know a few years ago when when we rolled into to my Edwis, we had to update all the swimming pool campground numbers, septage hauler numbers, all that stuff. So all those numbers are available through that Power BI report. You can filter down to your your county or your counties for the district health departments and kind of see, you know, the specific num pool numbers and whether it's a dash 02 or dash 03 because they had an, a, another pool there previously that was closed down and those type of things. So um, she also wanted me to mention that she's been <clears throat> been working with the uh, enforcement unit, Brad and, and his team on uh, better ways to get uh, response for those, you know, late fees and folks that aren't paying paying for their license. So we're, we're you know, we're not issuing a, an operating license and they're continuing to operate. So we've we've been seeing some uh, some successes in that effort uh, lately in in certain areas, and we'll continue to utilize whatever whatever tools we can um, in trying to uh, improve the, the the late fees and the licensing and and all that stuff um, and I think posting you know publicly on our on our program website the the status of all those active pools has has uh, helped us out there too um, but there was a, a question in the chat about explaining the difference between uh, expired and rejected uh, for a pool status listed on that power bi report expired is kind of um, that's going to show up for a pool that had a 2023 license that um, maybe that pool uh, is is no longer open for the year. Uh, basically, it just means that whatever whatever's listed for that that year's license, it it was issued and it expired at the end of the the calendar year. If it's listed, if the status is listed as rejected, that's going to mean that. Um, a fee payment was made for the license, but we're not able to issue the license yet, and that might be due to them having a, uh, uh, a not approved or uh, not in compliance inspection from the previous year. So we need a you know a satisfactory inspection to be able to release the license, or there's some other compliance issue going on where um, we've indicated that yeah we're we're holding your license until this happens. Um, and usually that's uh, 
a requirement of us to send out a written notification of, of why that license is being rejected. So if you have specific questions on a specific pool, please reach out to us. We can we can kind of give you the backstory. Eventually through through that my Edwis update, you'll be able to see more and more of that information yourselves uh, if if you're a, a my Edwis user. But um, until we get there, we can provide the the background should you need it. But yeah, I don't know if if Karen or Josh or Zach or Barbara or all four of you had any thoughts on swimming pools and what we would see showing up in the uh, in substantial compliance or the not in compliance designation for for those inspections. I think the uh, annotated form that was mentioned prior kind of highlights most of the areas that would be uh, higher elevated issues for non-compliance. Obviously, if they have no residual, um, that's a huge red flag. Inoperable equipment, um, pump leaking, not you know things like that, not operating 24-7. Flow rates are a huge one. I see a lot of issues where the facility, for some reason, has no knowledge of their pool volume. Um, they're just their design specs from when it was constructed, and they have an incorrect volume, so their flow rates are an unknown to them, and they're all over the board. So when we receive equipment change forms, we try to make sure that we're meshing all of the equipment. That's why we ask for the forms to be completed in the entirety so that we make sure that flow rates, piping sizes and filters and pumps all mesh together and that we're getting all of that data correctly in Eddy because someday everybody's going to be able to pop in there and view that to determine um, if it is accurate, if they want to make changes, we can do so effectively that way. But we're trying to get a handle on on that. But um, so flow rates are a huge one that may or may not be met. Um, and if they're very low, we would have to get that corrected. Um, so if anybody ever has questions on what a flow rate should be for a facility, you can reach out to us and we can look in the back files if we don't have that currently in Eddy. Um, so those are those are some of the main things. Um, main drains, there's some issues that at this point, there's some new standards and new requirements for current construction or production of main drains or manufacturing of them. So those have a life expectancy. We really don't have a handle or, or monitor that. It's, it's on the facility owner, but that's something that they should be aware of that should be changed if the expiration has come and gone on those main drains. They can be anywhere from five years to the stainless steel drains are 25 years of life expectancy. So most of the drains we see ha should have been changed by now. Um, again, we're hoping to get a better handle on that as well. Um, I don't know if Josh wants to jump in on a couple things. You covered it pretty well. And I think this color coded inspection report covers it pretty well too. A um, couple of things I would mention or I guess reiterate as um, immediate compliance issues that should warrant a, a failed inspection would be your water chemistry, you know, not meeting the standards, either not enough disinfectant in the pool or the pH is out of range for the disinfectant level. And the other one is a, a cloudy pool. If it's so cloudy that you can't see the main drains from standing on the deck, um, the concern there is that you couldn't see a submerged bather if there was one um, and that they should be closed um, and address that issue. We can reopen them as soon as they've addressed it. And the other thing I like to mention is um, a lot of these items are, you know, as we've talked about, kind of a judgment call, um, kind of hard to say um, what should warrant a closure and what shouldn't. 
Um, I always encourage that you cite whatever you find, um, give them some time to correct it, I even if it's a small item. You know, if the next year's inspection comes up and that item still hasn't been addressed, uh, you can elevate it to a higher level. Uh, otherwise, we end up just going round and round. Years go by and, you know, these small items don't get addressed. Yeah, I'd like to say that the green can become yellow, which can become red. Um, you know, multiple greens year after year, they're just an owner that just ignores maybe these inspections or it's just a different person each year that they don't see the prior year's inspection and aren't aware of it. So that's where these are just general guidelines. So if you have three, four years of a green item that's been noted, then that can be elevated to a yellow, to a red and so on. So these are just general guidelines. There's nothing set in stone that um, makes these the <laughs> warrant uh, the priority. We just went through and prioritized them based on health and safety, but it doesn't mean that multiple ones over years of being ignored don't elevate up. Great point, Karen. Yeah, and I, I want to emphasize that a little bit too, that yeah, if, if you're seeing green items, let's, let's still notch down from that in compliance to insubstantial compliance. Let's still still add those inspection comments to the report form. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to trigger our staff to do something as we're we're seeing that uh, inspection report come into our system with that designation that's going to start showing up maybe as conditions on their their license. Um, so that we're we're documenting it from from the beginning of when that issue arose and we can yeah, like Josh said, you know, if it if it if we don't kind of call it out at first, it will it will continue on and, and then could be multi year approach to getting it corrected if if it ever does um, without enforcement or some other uh, impetus to, to to cause that change. But if we're we're documenting it right away, you know, that gets on our radar. That's something that we're going to be looking at. If it's if it's flagged as still in compliance, we're going to just assume everything's good there. Um, again, trying to get to that automation where we're focusing uh, the bulk of our time on the issues and, and the corrections that are needed out there as opposed to the things that we think are are operating quite well and and don't need a, a second set of eyes to, to look at. So if you're seeing seeing issues, um, as minor as they may be, go ahead and flag them. If if you're unsure what what level it rises to, you know that's kind of what these these resources are for. This this annotated uh, inspection report form, and we can share that again with uh, with all of you uh, when we send out the the link to the recording. Um, the new the new build out in MyEdwis will kind of flag the the low, medium, and high priorities for each of the rules. Um, but yeah, if they're recurring year after year after year, maybe it notches up from from a medium to a high or a low to a medium. Let's get it addressed before it becomes a, a real big problem. Yeah, I don't know if anybody had any uh, questions related to pools, campgrounds or septage. Uh, I know our staff are working with <clears throat> quite a few of you on very unique situations out there. We've 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 had a lot of interesting things come up over the last year, um, including, you know, unapproved construction and operation. I, I mentioned campgrounds earlier, but we've also seen that occur with a, a few swimming pools where they maybe pulled a, a local building code or local building inspector permit to to build a, a commercial pool, but didn't get uh, Eagle approval, didn't understand the process. We're, we're trying to work on educating folks a little bit better on, on what's required for that. And uh, of course, some, some of those situations happen to occur at campgrounds. So campgrounds installing pools with without understanding the regulations and the, you know, the, the building requirements uh, within our Eagle administrative rules for it. So it's it's been uh, 
trying to work with those out of state contractors or builders to to understand our regulations and our design standards and and trying to retrofit something to to meet them as as best we can so it's it's been um that's occurred more times than it should have in the last year or two um yeah we're seeing a lot of similar things occurring at campgrounds and and that's why we've we've brought on additional engineering support to help with that just uh, as as sarah mentioned camping is big biz business in michigan now um, all the existing campgrounds are if they have room wanting to expand wanting to provide more amenities to to their customers through um, site water sewer connections upgraded electrical uh, bigger sites you know glamping units yurts things like that so we're we're seeing a lot of interesting applications come in and um, you know getting notified of postings on hip camp we're getting notified uh, by local zoning and land use officials of things getting um, changed or installed constructed without going through the appropriate approval paths whether that's uh, at eagle and or you know pulling the appropriate local health department well and septic permits too you've got a couple of things in chat jeremy okay All right, the uh, first question is, I have a question about site water connections at campgrounds and clarification on the use of hose bib vacuum breakers. Sarah, are you still on? I know this one comes up quite a bit. And... Yep, I'm still here. Okay. So. I was seeing this violation cited on like every inspection report starting in 2014. And so we finally sat down with community water supply engineers, non-community program staff. I think um, Dana, I, I can't remember who all was in the room now. It's been like 10 years, but the atmospheric vacuum breakers are not designed to be under pressure. So we're not requiring them on sites where RVs are going to be hooking up to them because there are downstream shutoff valves that get showers and sinks. So those atmospheric vacuum breakers are just going to fail and leak in like a, an hour or a day. Um, obviously, there are plenty of other places in the campground where we where you need to require them. Fish cleaning stations, service buildings, um, even convenience outlets, which are not supposed to be threaded. But we know in real life, people need them sometimes for cleaning purposes. So we've even added a little blurb on the inspection report saying if a convenience outlet is threaded, it needs a AVB and the hose should be removed between use. So it is messy, but we just we can't support atmospheric vacuum breakers where the line is under pressure. Um, that is kind of risky when you think about you know, between campsites, they're not really protecting each other. Um, those campsites are not protected against each other. So when we do industry trainings, I'm constantly talking to owners about monitoring, keeping your eyes peeled, making sure you don't have like seasonal campers that might be there spring, summer, and fall. They've set up house. They're there for three quarters of the year. God knows what hobbies they're doing. Um, you know, kind of keep an eye out for what people are doing out there because that is their water supply that is their um liability that is their you know supply to protect so the owners really need to stay sharp um and in theory if we were to protect each campsite it, when there's rvs or when there's lines under pressure they would literally have to be pressure vacuum breakers six inches above the highest outlet. So think of these tall, huge RVs out there. Think of the tallest like shower head. The pressure vacuum breaker would have to be six inches in the air above that and tested every year. And that that's just not feasible. That That's never gonna happen. I mean, I guess I can't say never, but that's just not feasible. So yeah. that's been our stance yeah. since like 2015. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I, I guess 
you know, to kind of add on a little bit there, the the complicating part is when when we have these uh, seasonal, you know, rentals of of the campsite where where maybe they have a split spigot. You know, one goes to their park model or their RV or whatever, and there's no uh, no AVB on that one, but they they have another another portion that comes off for you know watering their lawn or gardening or you know whatever you know yeah likely they should have an AVB on on that um, as long as they don't have a nozzle on the end of that hose like Sarah said the you know the complications with with keeping that that under pressure the whole time. Um, the next question was, uh, can you talk about how the handling of hip camps has been going throughout the state? And um, for some of the new folks, hip camp is kind of a, uh, a web service similar to Airbnb or uh, vacation rental by owner, Verbo, for property owners that maybe want to make a few bucks uh, letting folks camp on, on their property. Um, we became aware of this website a few years ago. Um, Brad Lascasi, our, our enforcement uh, EQA, and Sarah met closely with the administrators of that website many times to to try and educate them on <clears throat> on Michigan's camping requirements to to understand that you know our our statutory regulations start at five you know the five sites or five recreational units or more so if they're if they're only offering four sites or allow four recreational units at, at one time um, that's fine provided they're still complying with local health department requirements you know well and septic uh, if they're if they're offering any of those services uh, and any local zoning or land use um, ordinances or requirements there too we you know, we're we're aware of several township ordinances that you know anything above two two recreational units is requiring them to be zoned appropriately with setback distances, uh, a, you know, certain size acreage, things like that. So um, Brad and Sarah did have some some good success. That's not saying that people aren't continuing to add on there, but the administrators of of the hip camp website are supposed to be providing information to those new uh, new accounts, those new users on the website. That uh, there is an Eagle campground program. They need to check with uh, any local, you know, zoning land use or other approvals. They need to they need to connect with local health departments on any well and septic concerns or issues there um, but yeah as those come up we're, we're kind of handling them case by case uh, some letter writing so that they understand uh, the requirements and approvals that are needed we typically copy you know all the local units of government on that so that the zoning and land use folks can can be aware of what's going on and address address that through their ordinances and approval process um, and yeah, copy the local health departments. Um, we've we've gotten some success where folks have modified their their use to to less than four. They've actually applied to become a licensed campground. Uh, like I said, there's still going to be a few a few out there, and as they come up, we'll we'll continue to to work with our enforcement unit to to handle them appropriately. I see another question. Would Eagle be able to issue a memo to local health departments in regards to hose bib vacuum breaker requirements at campgrounds? Um, yeah, I have to look. I, I'm thinking that there was a communication. It might not have been in the form of a memo, uh, but we can try and find that, that historical communication and reshare that. Make sure it's it's still up to date. And I know uh, I talked with uh, with both Tip and and Chris down in Monroe about a um, seasonal startup sampling memo or one pager as well that kind of addresses the difference between a campground operating on their own well or one connected to a municipal water supply 
uh, ones that operate throughout the winter, you know, never, never depressure, pressurize, uh, kind of some of the, the subtle differences between all of those. So um, that's on the list. I haven't forgotten about it. I just haven't been able to uh, find time to get that across the finish line yet. Uh, kind of a follow up question. What has Eagles type two non com staff said about the uh, hose bib vacuum breaker at campground pedestal pedestals and and yeah, Sarah responded in the chat that that was kind of a, a group dis internal discussion involving non community uh, drinking water staff and community water supply staff. To talk about um, the campground situation and, and what made sense. Uh, another question, am I telling pool facilities correctly that disinfectants should be in range between one and five parts per million chlorine and two and ten parts per million bromine? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if our pool engineers want to jump back on. We've had a uh, a lot of discussion on this over the last few years and and there's what we've maybe leaned on is some of the uh, certified pool operator documents model aquatic health code and other things because the the issue isn't so much the the minimum it's what what's the suitable maximum so i'll i'll toss it to to karen and zach So typically, yes, our rules have the minimum. Minimum is one and two, depending on pH. Um, those are low, depending on bather loads. So I would say if you are just a handful of people per day <clears throat> using that pool, you might be able to get away with a lower <clears throat> residual. However, if you're like a hotel or something where the, the bather load fluctuates or gets highly increased on the weekends, um, you will want to adjust and make sure you have a higher minimum residual. Usually we say five and less. Um, once you hit over five, five to 10, you can have complaints because people will be experiencing um, skin, eye irritation, um, things like that. So you don't want to be in that range all the time. If you're expecting a huge bather load and you go to, you know, five or six to compensate for that bather load, it's going to, you know, gradually decrease. So you're okay there. But I wouldn't want to consistently keep that level there um, for a couple of reasons. Like I said, the irritation. Um, another one, it's costly to the facility to keep that high level of disinfectant in there when it's really not necessary. Um, and then the other thing too is a those um, colorimeter readers are up to 10 typically. So that's kind of why that's our max um, beyond 10. We usually recommend that pool to be closed because it's such a high level of residual um, that we don't want that irritation or that type of chemicals um, for the bathers. So I hope that answered it. If not, let me know. Or if Zach has more to add, feel free. No, I just I just was going to mention what you already covered with the pH dependent on that, and it's relevant to the pH there. All right, thank you. Okay, I, yeah, I don't see any more questions trickling in, but but uh, you know, as things come up later, um, you know, that's kind of why we showed the the staff coverage maps certainly reach out to your your point of contact. Uh, our teams meet pretty consistently. You know, we try and get the campground swimming pool engineers together. About every week and a half, you know, every 10 days. Of course, that's dependent on schedules. Um, you know, folks that are out doing field work in the summer, we, we maybe might be every two weeks or three weeks, but but yeah, we try and talk about every situation or um, troubleshooting question that comes up as as a team, so that we're you know responding consistently throughout the state. I know the septage program uh, 
we have a monthly meeting, but they're talking with each other on a daily basis as these questions and situations come in. So feel free to reach out to your your local contact. Uh, they should be able to to help you through your situation. Uh, if it's a very unique situation, like a lot of the ones we've been receiving lately, we'll we'll talk about it as a team and get your response as as soon as we can. Kind of the same with uh, you know uh, side by side inspection requests or in field training. Um, let us know early, and we'll try and incorporate that into our schedules. Uh, we understand you're busy. Uh, what, um, we've got a lot of obligations on on our plates too that we're trying to to accommodate. But if you get us a request in early, we can we can certainly uh, get that scheduled out and and provide uh, in field training should it be needed. Um, if you know it's not so much in field training that's being requested, but maybe a situational type training or assist that's needed, where we can always be available. You know, for a phone call while you're while your inspectors out in the field, too, to try and talk through things. You know, with technology, it's easy to snap a quick photo of what you're looking at and send it through a Teams chat or email or text even. And uh, you know, our staff can try and walk through the situation with you and the, the best way to respond. Uh, if if you have any any needs for that, you know, kind of give us a heads up when when you're going to be out in the field, and we'll let you know who's going to be available in the office uh, during those times, and and we can help that way too. But again, I just wanted to uh, to thank you all for your your time today. I know it's very valuable, um, and for your your dedication, your interest in in these programs, uh, we we appreciate. And and love your your help and support uh, to make these programs the best they can be for for the state of Michigan. Um, I've been taking a few notes on on some of the items that we'll provide with with the the link to this recording. But uh, like I said, any other questions that you think of after after we're we're done today, feel free to send those in and and we can share additional information and resources. I think it usually takes about a day or two to get the recording posted to the to the YouTube website, so it might be early next week. Um, but again, thank you. Uh, have a great day. I don't want to dip into anybody's lunchtime, so um, we'll go ahead and, and end the meeting right now. I'll, I'll stop the uh, stop the recording.